I'm Bill Morish. Uh, I'm, uh, I am the lucky person who gets to uh, lead this course. Uh, working with me is Desiree Lavecchia and, and Christina uh, McEldry. They're back there. Raise your hands. Um, they're, uh, they're our teaching assistants. This is uh, a really exciting course in some regards. This is a, a, a real city course, uh, a city course where uh, there's some people here uh, taking it for credit towards degree, and the rest of us are continuing our education and trying to figure out how to, after our, we've gotten our degree, how we keep uh, learning and, and teaching ourselves uh, to do what we're all interested in, is um, making a city uh, for us to live and thrive in. Um, so we have, uh, we're kicking off today with uh, 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 the group from the right to the city and others in that discussion, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but I, because this is a, a course and it's the beginning of the semester, I have to do a little orientation uh, to what we're going on. Um, but um, I wanted to do this because it, to show you how uh, the two uh, classrooms, to speak, really are, are intersecting each other on the topics. Um, this urban colloquium, uh, which is a really fancy word um, for symposium, which is an even fancier word for uh, people get in a room with uh, not much oxygen and have great conversation and listen to cool people. Um, but the Greeks had great language to describe these normal events. Um, but the colloquium, uh, what we decided to do uh, in that tradition of the colloquium is the gathering of ideas and people. And um, the notion of urban encuentro and urban encounter um, is very uh, going to be continuing through this course. Um, this is a course where we have students who are involved in a new field, which has been defined as urban ecology, which Miguel, uh, Professor Miguel Robles Durand here, my um, comrade in arms. Um, he, it's really great. He's brought red to black outfits um, in, in New York, which is very exciting. Yes, thank you. Uh, we were running, we were getting bored with black. Um, and uh, <laughs> his students know what I'm talking about, but anyway. Um, but uh, what I think is interesting about the notion of the, the word encounter, which is the English translation of the Spanish word, and um, this is my uh, wonderful friend, the 3D thesaurus, which I, I totally love, uh, which shows the relationship of all these words. And in many regards, urban ecology uh, used to be years ago a relationship to the biosciences and the biophysical world. Um, but what's interesting in knowing some of the founders of the urban ecology movement, much of the language that is used to describe natural processes actually has its origin in social cultural observation. Um, because how else would we understand what the biology is doing if we don't think they are like what we do? Because I don't think the amoeba know they are encountering anything, um, except somebody's going to eat them. But, uh, so, so what's interesting about this idea of beginning to the right of the city and, and talking about encounters um, is, is two things. One, uh, what we're playing with this course, and also what I'm going to push the panel today, is um, uh, if we got our right to the city, what would we do with it? How would we actually have to run our cities? This is one of the kind of interesting subtexts of sustainability. Everybody talks about it, and I go, well, that's great, but I've got to run home and turn my windows open and get real fast before it heats up, and then I'll be back. It means I have to sort of really start living to the rhythms and systems of other things besides the nine to five clock. Um, so if the, uh, and also having my personally been involved in multiple layers of this movement over many years, starting in Berkeley in the late 60s, which was a fun time to go to college. Uh, fun time, yeah, much longer hair, much longer hair. Um, and you carried it to Vaseline, just in case the tear gas went off a little bit on the way, just put a little on there and it helped. Uh, then they switched formulas and that was not a good idea. So anyway, so just remember if you think you got them beat, they'll change the formula on you. So, uh, so um, I decided to go underground and into the system um, and begin to, as many of you have, uh, develop the encounters. So this course, we are, um, uh, in the beginning of the course, I have five uh, quotes. Um, and part of what this course is, is as we are studying what we need to do, we're also going to be defining the field that we want to be able to work in. This is what I find is a very interesting time 
in society and education is the institutions that have been known for years have no idea what to do in the future, quite literally. And I, that's, you want to start with in banking to higher education or whatever, you pick one. And, it, and that's an opportunity. It also means it's, it's confusing. But in pulling together our series of quotes, um, we begin to understand that urban ecology is about coexistence. It's a recognition that, that the so-called nature that we talk about is a hybrid artificial and natural system. It's ours. So if we think nature is attacking us, it's sort of like, hello. Um, but it is also something we completely forget about on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, knowledge, as you will see in a, uh, a book that you'll start reading, and I recommend it all to you, Lewis Hyde, Common as Air, um, is that we see today, is not only do we have to fight for our rights in our cities, on our streets, but we have to fight for our rights and our knowledge on, on every bit of information that we feed into the system, will we have actually access to it to be able to determine our own uh, economic or ecological existence. Um, and in fact, the digital world is created, as you'll see from a friend of mine, Rob van Cranenberg, who has not only worked for the rights of the city people in Belgium and immigrants there, but is also fighting a fight called the Internet of Things, which is the freedom of information, which is going on right now, which we don't talk about in the US, but is a huge battle in Europe, where the environment itself has become the interface, that essentially technology is outside of our brains. And then the right. Uh, using David Harvey's quote, is that we do have a collective right to the city, but more importantly, it's the city relies upon our ability to constantly reinvent it. If you don't have that process, if you don't keep making plans, the system dies. So this class is going to explore this monster agenda by the fact of setting up an educational format an information base that this inaugural year will start laying down a platform of information for the next sequence of urban colloquiums in the next couple of years. That every graduating, every group of students who come through, and all of you who come through invited guests, your information is going to be aggregated and implemented into this and hopefully into an open platform where one can begin to sort of find ideas and things about urban ecology. So we're going to, in this class, uh, go through three major topics, which I call working zones. These are areas that I see that are really um, hot topics right now. One is what's now known as not climate change, um, but not, uh, not even sustainability, which is a realization that we live in a state of inescapable ecologies. Whether you like it or not, your ancestors left you a little something in the ground, right? Um, and all of that smog in Beijing is going to be landing in the trees in Alaska soon um, and defoliating the forest. We we'll also live in a long period of history um, which has radically altered our relationship between technology and politics. The second one is known as the Internet of Things or People, uh, which I would say 20 years ago would not have been as pronounced as it is, and it has everything to do with the digital age. We would have talked about, you know, uh, international global sharing and so forth. But this has everything to do with the absolute existence and right for us to own our ideas. Which is, you know, like, oh God, another thing I'm going to lose access to, <laughs> right? So turn off your iPad. So somebody's like taking pictures of their iPad. You're feeding information to Cisco right now. So anyway. Um, the last one, yeah. <laughs> Anything you bought today, they know what you bought, right? They, know they, they all converged in here. And the last one is an area which I call other properties, which takes us back to this point, which is, you know, how do we talk about uh, an era of the last 50 years when we refer to our city as land uses, as yellow for housing, as red for commercial, and oh, by the way, mixed income housing is called orange, yeah, somewhere between yellow and red which sets up an immediate hostility. Purple for, uh, and blue for institutions, that's kind of sweet. Um, purple for industry, problematic. Um, but there used to be two co colors, black and white, in the zoning map. But that era is disappearing. We're now going into a world where it's completely hybrid. Um, we'll be talking not only about uh, today, where we're talking about what are we really talking about when we say housing, 
um, to MakerBots and the MakerBots Society, to food trucks as uh, institutional systems. And then what we'll do um, is we'll also be doing uh, one form of design which we don't usually talk about. We usually talk about when you hear the word design, you, want it, you think I'm making something, a building, a house, a, a shoe, a bottle of water. But actually the first de definition of design is to actually define the terms by which we're going to name and frame the question. We're designing a strategy. We're designing a question. And then and inherent in that is how we're going to evaluate it. And this is something we've referred to years and years as called programming. We don't care. We'll have it done. We'll run down to it. But this becomes absolutely critical. So we'll be looking at four thematics across these three. And you'll get used to my drawings and diagrams. We'll do that. So I always try to draw out everything, which, by the way, came from doing community work where I watched people doodle over in drawings. And I, their drawing was much better than my fancy one. So I started drawing like them when we started communicating. But essentially, they're cognitive drawings. But we're looking at four design themes, which I think are important, and 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 breaking down a, the kind of question uh, that one usually comes up in urban ecology. And out of that, we'll end up with a matrix of turns, a kind of collision. Um, by the way, you have homework. Sco school officially begins now, so uh, winter's over. Um, and they go, oh, no, no, just uh, no more reading. Oh yeah, we have three readings, one book. Go buy this book. It's a really good one. Lewis Hyde is an amazing. Uh, writer, uh, Common as Air, start reading that. We have two articles by David Harvey, The Right to the City, and The Insurgent Architect at Work, which I think is a very important piece because it fits to that other article because he talks about what he thinks the rights to the city are as, from a creative and political um, approach. What, what, what should we be asking for? It's a very, very important piece. And I always come back and, well, how would I complete that agenda? How would I work with it? Another thing, in this kind of work, um, I want to activate the left and right side of your brain. I know I have students over here that are way over here like me who can barely write and want to draw all day long. I did as a child on the wall of my family home all the time. <laughs> and then over here, uh, people I rely upon heavily who can really write beautifully and write as, write as beautifully as I can paint or draw. A really in this kind of problem. So a great way to take notes is to, uh, on the right side of your page, draw any doodle or put any sort of picture. On the left side, put sentences and always ask yourself, activate the word. Don't just put in there like comfort. Say it's really hot in here. All right? So work in that manner. Keep in that way because the ideas in urban ecology exist in a physical world and they've it, it written in, in, in a written world. This is what's really interesting and problematic about it. It's a place where ideas become space and space become ideas. And we've usually just gone through that and called it process. But this is an area where we really find the grit to, to, to work out. And as we go in, I'll explain to you how I have and other people have used this process to really quarry down to find out how to find the ingredients for moving forward. OK, so what we're going to do today is have two, two uh, rounds of discussion. Um, on, the, on the same topic, the right to the city. And what I'm, I'm going to do is pose in the first round, and then we'll have a little break, let some air come in here and then come back in. Um, in the first round, what I'm very interested in is what is the nature and structure and components of this movement? Beyond the sort of topic, which I think we all, I think all here agree, <laughs> how do you define it granular in the name of your organization, the nature of your territory, how you work, you know, how would you describe yourself with adjectives and active nouns and verbs? And really begin to sort of see the array and diversity of your capacity. Then we're going to take a break. And we give you time on the second one, because already, we already talked about it a little bit. I want to ask you the second question. Given what you are doing, let's say the next mayor or benevolent whatever person said, <laughs> we've got we to find somebody. <laughs> or we all decided that we're going to do this. And we all agreed that this is important. How would you get 10,000 housing units up in one year? How would you meet 20% of the demand that you face? What are the things that keep you from going? Not just, oh, they won't let me do it. I won't allow that. I won't allow it. The one city hall won't let me. They don't let anybody. You <laughs> they don't let anybody in. You have to tell me sort of what are the issues. And in that way, 
we can begin to start defining some of those kinds of key issues. Because in many regards, we're not just talking about housing. Now, to just sort of prime the pump, give you a little context of how the, this country sees the world we actually live in. The discussion you hear most of the time in zoning, planning, and development, economic development about um, new ha on housing basically is about new housing starts. The gross national product, they're saying it's up. They talk, the housing starts is only brand new houses. They don't count the fact that somebody could do a $2 million renovation of a house. That doesn't come up. It has to be brand new houses, which is sort of like, what? Which is only 2 to 3% of all the housing stock in our country. So you have this little tiny group. That's why the Builders Association love this supply chain. And all the financing models go to that. So the question is, what about the other 97%? I try to get to 99%. I know it's really cool, but it's actually about 97%. Um, and it represents anywhere from 85 to 80% of the land area of the city. Right? And is that in a discussion? No, Hudson Yards, Atlantic Yards. Atlantic Yards, that's all discussion, but not 80% of the city is not being discussed at any one time. Now, I don't think you ever heard of this in the, in the national election, right? And all innovation, it's all one size fits all, and it's all pretty standard. If you go into real estate development, it's not a fancy formula. It's a very basic formula. Basically, the developer tries to get somebody else to pay for the money while they try to get the project through zoning, and then they sell it. It's not hard. It's just whether you can get those things to align. Another thing, to scale. I have actually did a lot of work in Minneapolis in the 1990s and 2000s. Everybody thinks Minneapolis is a perfect place. Everybody gets along there. Uh, they're happy. They have metropolitan government. They're not. They fight just like the rest of us, um, except in, 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 uh, during the hockey playoffs in March. Um, but um, that's when the whole city just stops. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, we did analysis of the first ring suburb, which is very interesting um, because, again, everybody thinks the suburb's fine. Um, and at that time, the first ring suburb has more people in the first ring than the two cities in the center. Mm. It's, so, it's also the most viable stock because it's between the, uh, uh, employment on both sides. But yet it's 50 years old. No one's looked at it. There's 250,000 houses in those areas, of which 40,000 are basically worn out. This is 1953, 1955, 61 housing, basically worn out, basically incapable of being and managing housing. And you pick all the NGOs, all the organizations together who are out there saving this thing, 52 cities, the Metropolitan Council, state and local aid, and last year they, they renovated 325 homes. So I don't, I don't want you to get all depressed, but... <laughs> This is why just sort of, you're making this a small issue, like, you know, we need a right to housing, which is important, rather than flipping it around saying, what's the stability of, of everywhere where we live, becomes a major, major question. And finally, um, in some regards, this is hard, but it's easy to put a roof over a family's head. I think what we're talking about is not only doing that trick, but to plug them into the systems of the Commonwealth so that you can have a roof over your head, but you can actually thrive under that roof, expand and maybe even shape your roof a little differently, <laughs> and become contributors to the city. So we're going to start out today, and I wanted to leave you with this amazing picture of a Dutch artist. He used to be homeless, um, and they found him out in the back. He was building the city. He's known as an outside artist, which is very clever. This is what curators do to you. But anyway, uh, it's a great, it's a, they're, they're, there's a whole group called the Outside Artists. And this was a, a show, actually, I saw in Belgium uh, when I was visiting Rob Van Krenenberg, who will be here in, um, uh, in March. Um, uh, Bertus Jonkers is um, a homeless person who has some psychological issues. He's been building this town. Uh, thanks to social housing, he has a nice house small house um, in the Netherlands, and he keeps building this city. And it's all over his house. It's coming out the backyard, and it's moving into the museums. And this is the city where everybody gets to invent their own dreams. So with that, we're going to have the group. Miguel's going to introduce our first round and get some character of this 
Yes. Urban ecology. Thank you very much. Here we go. <laughs> we'll leave that there. Yeah, it's very exciting. Yeah, very exciting. I mean, one thing that uh, with the, the very eloquent uh, talk of Bill that was not mentioned before I even introduced myself is that um, this class is a public class. Um, uh, every single one of you that don't belong to this class are invited every Thursday exactly at this time. We're going to have panels and speakers. Uh, uh, it's going to be loaded uh, these topics. So. Um, yeah, pretty much it's a class for all of you uh, if you want to come and, and you if you want to and it's not really a class right I mean, it, it, it is a class, but it's not structured as such especially um, uh, If we want to talk about these topics and discuss them uh, So there's great people coming if, if you want to follow up uh, on what's going on. My name is Miguel Robles Duran I direct the graduate program that um, uh, of urban ecology design and urban ecology is here and um, this is one initiative that, well, Bill has been incredibly instrumental of actually in allowing uh, to happen here at the New School, but we're really trying to, to push um, outside uh, of the sort of common canons of uh, urban pedagogy. Uh, I would say not push, but really go much beyond, I mean, the, that. Uh, and, and really try to concentrate on the city that Bill was mentioning on, which is that sort of 80 to 90 percent now of, of, of that city, uh, which is, uh, has been absolutely ignored. Um, which we're a new program, we're a new graduate program. We've been one semester strong. I hope uh, that the, the students, uh, we have incredible students, 26 um, incredible students at the moment that have been uh, getting their sort of their efforts worth uh, for okay. being here. All the students um, raise their hands. You can ask them. Yeah. There they are. Yes. Um, so I, I hope you guys are ex as excited as I am to so begin you're again. You have to have the answers you need. So. Yeah. <laughs> and and we have organized already a series of events uh, in order to to really emphasize what we're trying to do. Um, and not long ago, uh, actually, it was in November, if I'm not mistaken. It was November when we did the uh, the, the urban uprisings. Um, we we December, right? It was November, December, somewhere there. Yeah, end of November, beginnings of December. Uh, we had a, an, an amazing collaboration uh, built up out of just desires, and it just came together in an incredible form. Uh, we created these um, these first sort of non-new school base, which is one of the things that I love about uh, this situation, that we're expanding beyond just the, the boundaries of the new school and really bringing in and us bringing ourselves out of the situation. We were work, work together with uh, the Right to the City Alliance, uh, which is, um, yeah, I, I would say an uh, incredible inspiration organization that has been trying to restructure um, uh, its procedures uh, after Rachel uh, took over and she's going to be joining us um, here. Um, but also, um, this wouldn't be sort of possible if the work of Lenina was not around. I mean, Lenina is actually responsible for organizing this. Um, and, um, and then, well, the other sort of very important party that uh, came together uh, in, the, in this Urban Uprisings uh, conference, was a two-day conference, was uh, the Brecht Forum. Um, Brecht Forum, as many of you know, uh, it has had... Uh, a controversial sort of past in terms of, you know, its name, beginning with its name. I mean, it used to be known as the, the New York Marxist School. And, um, and um, you know, <laughs> there are some people that are afraid of saying it and some people that are not. But, um, but the reality is that it's, a, it's an epicenter, it's an epicenter of a sort of anti anti-capitalist uh, sort of uh, theories and discourse and they also have an amazing public program I really encourage you to see it uh, right now they're working on black history uh, and they put on together an amazing uh, sort of yeah setting on black history uh, on it so I'd also encourage you to go they also inaugurated today so you start basically today uh, uh, so and from that part uh, Kasembe is uh, joining and so he's gonna be joining in the panel too um, uh, so thanks Kasembe for, for being around um, and uh, the next um, incredible partner that worked together in this Urban Uprisings event, um, it's Growing Roots. Um, Growing Roots actually was kind of the soul and the, the mover of, 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 of the whole thing. I mean, Matt, Matt uh, you know, uh, th th think. Amaka, yes, I saw Amaka. Matt and Amaka were very responsible for um, uh, for also working together and building this amazing event. And so 
uh, you know, thanks, Matt, you're going to be joining today over here. And we also had a partner at that time, which was also absolutely amazing. I hope there's some representation here, which was uh, the, um, well, the, the Graduate Center at, uh, at CUNY, uh, or in, over here in New York, uh, City University in New York, which was basically the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics, uh, guided by, by David Harvey, uh, that uh, participated in building up this program. We have uh, high ambitions of, you know, of what all these things might look like uh, in the future. And I guess this is one of those sort of just encuentros, right? It's not that big event that we organize in Urban Uprisings so today, like really high, uh, highly organized thing, but this is supposed to be a very informal uh, uh, encuentro. And, uh, but it's also, you know, encouraging or already saying what's up next. I mean, how are we going to be working together? How are we going to be defining issues uh, together and, and not close ourselves here? Um, another person that is joining today, it's Carmen Pinedo, um, uh, Pinero, sorry, um, which is, uh, comes from Community Voices Heard, uh, an incredibly important organization. I'm sure that you, you're going to be um, listening to, uh, yeah, actually all the panelists are absolutely amazing. Um, and um, we have Frank Morales, uh, which is over here. Um, those of you that have heard the name, there, he needs no introduction, but those of you that haven't, he's uh, pretty much a... Uh, the greatest legend in squatting in New York or something like that. I don't know how to call it, but it's a, a really a, a legend, uh, an Episcopal priest, a uh, writer, a scholar. And, um, and we are incredibly honored that he also started to teach in, in our program. And so he's, uh, he's uh, teaching right now a course based on urban homesteading with Gabriela Rendon. And um, so we're trying to, you know, push, push that agenda uh, a bit further. And uh, lastly, I'm going to do some Priscilla Grimm. Um, Um, and Priscilla, you know, one of the, I guess, the most sounded organizers of Occupy uh, movement, uh, very, very invested in it, and um, also a great friend. So um, I guess we can start. Bill, the, the, the table is yours. Uh, yeah, sorry yours. for taking too, too long on, on this introduction, but uh, we have all these, these chairs here. There's going to be, for those of you that are, you know, there's going to be at least six or seven I'll places that you can just come. And Yes, that, yeah. the panel should be here, and sorry, I was not specific. <laughs> and you need to turn this mic on? For this? The, will they use this mic for this? Okay. This is the, uh, it's on. Yes. <laughs> So I, I think we could get started, and I'm going to amend my first statement by, by still wanting you to get down in detail. But we have an important moment in this city right now. We have shift in power, Elect election coming up. Hurricane Sandy, $50 billion floating around, which who cares? It's going to go up to Jersey somewhere. I, I don't know. But, uh, but you know, those things cause things to happen. And, and it'd be great if you not only touched about what you're doing, how you're reorganizing uh, since, but where these issues might also start playing in. So, okay. Yours. You can start from either end. No, I, we I guess we will start with uh, an ex alumni. <laughs> she was like, that's why she sat on the end, hoping no. she would get late. <laughs> no. Hi, um, my name is Priscilla Grimm, and I'm a media organizer with Occupy Wall Street. So what I do is um, I work a lot on the online efforts. Um, I work on OccupyWallST.org, and we are the 99% Tumblr blog. Um, we are in an interesting moment in our city's history right now. We've just survived the most devastating hurricane ever to hit the city. Um, and certainly, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how the machine of New York processes, processes this, you know, billions of dollars that are coming. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Um, that are coming to our city, that's coming to our city. Um, and it's my hope, uh, you know, we're working very hard in Occupy to kind of like retool and see where we're going next and see what the next big 
action is and how we can be most effective. And, you know, it's an open question right now that should be posed to you as much as it's posed to us who work on the movement every day because it is your movement. You know, we're, we're here to serve everyone and we're here to work with you and see what we can do together to change this unsustainable system that we're inside. So that's it. Just one question. What did, yes. did were you involved in any of the uh, recovery rescue efforts? Did your system help? I, well, at the website, we're the number one um, destination. When you Google Occupy Wall Street, our website is the first one that comes up. So of course, and we help coordinate the Facebook page that has over 400 and 20,000 people who are fans to it now. It's, uh, we're quickly coming close to the GOP presence on Facebook at this point. Um, and so we really, what we do is we have these very large amplifiers that we try to use for the best use of the movement. So when Occupy Sandy started getting together, our job really was to make sure that everybody heard about it. You know, so um, so that's basically what we did. Just made sure that, you know, that was on the site every day. It was in the social media every day. It still is. You know, we just reported today about there's almost 2,000 people still in the city who don't have electricity yet. Regardless if their houses can even take it or not, that's completely, you know, that's inexcusable in a city with more billionaires per capita than anywhere in the entire world. So um, that's what we've been doing. Come back to me with this. <laughs> you don't have that. He wants the coup de gras at the end. No, I, I got to figure out what I'm going to say. Okay, okay, okay good. <laughs> Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, Rachelle LaFarce with Right to the City Alliance. Um, first, I just want to say thank you um, and how lucky you all are that this course exists. Uh, Lenina, our, the communications director for Right to the City, and I were dreaming in the hallway before we came in how amazing it would have been. We, we both went to Hunter College uh, here in CUNY in New York City. How incredible it would have been to have had a course just like this. We had some very radical professors at Hunter, right? I mean, we had uh, some civil rights heroes, you know, people who really were instrumental in the civil rights movement. But even the best of them were not pushing or questioning beyond the demands-based fights that we were so used to having in this country. So you all are really lucky uh, to have this space to share with each other and be pushed in this way uh, to think differently about how you are going to enter the world upon graduating from this program. So I'm jealous, um, but glad to be able to participate in this component of it. Um, I just wanna say, uh, you know, just picking up on the, the, the Sandy question, I went to my cousin who makes oodles of money, had a pool party for her son at the Hilton Hotel in Staten Island on Saturday. And my son, who's two years old, loves to swim and of course was very happy to be there. But uh, upon taking a smoke break, yes, I'm smoking again. Um, <laughs> upon taking a smoke break outside the, the hotel, uh, I ran into a number of people who were still displaced from their homes and living at the Hilton for the past three months. And what was, uh, what was really interesting about the conversation with them was, you know, I asked the question around how the rebuilding was happening and if there was conversation or plannings around reinforcing the basements so that the flooding that took place wasn't gonna happen again. Uh, there was also a gentleman who was a contracted uh, electrician from Texas who was in the process of putting back up the power lines that had been taken down. And I said, well, is it being done in a way to prevent or sustain you know, what had happened before? And the answer was no. And I was awestruck that all of these billions of dollars could be being poured back into a rebuild without any questioning or conversation about what sustainable rebuilding looks like or resilient rebuilding looks like, what the rebuilding looks like that doesn't allow for this to happen and to devastate people's lives again. And I bring it up because I think it's one of the cornerstones that we're really trying to lift to the surface in terms of Right to the City's work. Um, right to the City is a, f uh, a conversation and a, a movement and a um, daily organizing struggle between currently 45 different organizations throughout the country, all of whom work on lots of different issues. Uh, I think what's both 
powerful and challenging about the right to the city frame is that it is so broad and it is a question about all of the different uh, aspects and components of a city and our right to claim and be a part of those. Um, and it's bringing these groups, many of whom have very left thinking staff, but not necessarily the membership of the organization. Uh, so bringing together these fights on lots of different issues in order for there to be a more systemic and uh, intentionally designed and smart approach to the rec reclamation of our cities. So that when our housing groups are engaged in the rebuild fight, the environmental groups are present in that conversation because it dramatically and qualita qualitatively changes what the rebuild looks like. So that when there's money coming from the federal government, the participatory budgeting process that Community Voices Heard is so instrumental in moving here in New York, and that Right to the City is really pushing in other cities throughout the country, brings to the table that the, the people who live in these communities have the right to participate in how this money gets parceled out and what the priorities are, right? So our goal, our dream, our desire is to spread this conversation and this integrated approach to our organizing work so that we're not working in silos, so that there's less competition with each other for attention. Um, and so that we really are thinking more holistically and in a visionary way around what's required to sustain a city and, 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 and build a city. Uh, and how do we do that together? Um, and I have lots more to say, but I'll shush for now. Hey, y'all. My name is Matt uh, Burko. And uh, I think that, that one of the things that, that Sandy has really shown me is, you know, Rochelle talked about sustainable rebuilding. And I think that one of the things that, that Sandy has really forced me to, to, to grapple with is the question of what might sustainable rebuilding actually look like. Um, I've worked a whole lot with, uh, with, with the Boggs Center to nurture community leadership in Detroit. And James Boggs used to ask the question all the time. He used to say, can New York City be made livable without the exodus of three or four million people from it? And I would hear it and say, what the hell is he talking about? He said, can New York City be made livable with, 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 with the population it has? And when I saw Sandy and I saw the difficulty that was providing food, that was providing water to all of the people who lost food, who lost water, people who lost electricity, you know, living above the sixth floor and water not getting above there, I began to say, wow. Is it, can we support, how many, anybody know how many square miles New York City is? 321? What, what does it take? Whose labor does it take to support 8 million people in 321 square feet? Miles, miles thank you. <laughs> like who? That's a, that's a whole other level of labor. Um, <laughs> I think the mayor's working on that. Well, hey, about yes. Yo, units. I think you're right. Um, but so I say this to say that I think that, that, that Sandy, in addition to the things that, that Rochelle has said and, 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 and Priscilla has said, and I'm sure Frank would have said, uh, we, uh, <laughs> I, I think that in addition to these very concrete steps about how we bring ourselves together, it also provides an opportunity to ask very important questions about how do we think about the future, how do we think about the future of the city? Um, and, and how do we think about the relationships of particularly New York City to the spaces that surround it and, and to the rest of the country and the rest of the world? Hi, my name is Kazimbe. I'm the Director of Education, of, uh, Director of Education and Outreach at the Breck Forum New York Marxist School. Um, <laughs> And, you know, still New York Marxist school. They still say, and I am a communist. Um, <laughs> i just make it very clear, you know. Um, um, you know, I mean, I think there's a couple of things for me that when I think about it, I think the first thing for me when you brought up that question, Bill, was the fact that we have to understand that we're in this very interesting period in New York City history when a, a direct representative of the ruling class is in control of New York City. Mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, and his wealth has doubled since he's been mayor of New York City, right? Um, when Giuliani left, um, he le Giuliani left underneath, underneath a defeat, actually. You know, he didn't get charter school reform. 
he, you know, what I'm saying people were pushing back to him on police brutality, you know, and he and he and he was routed in in, in this even this handling of 9/11 into a certain extent, right? In a lot of different ways, working class people are facing a whole different challenge with Mayor Bloomberg in control because he's essentially recreated his city. You know, first 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 way he's recreated his city was the attack on public education, because the fact of the matter is. If you want to undo the power of the Democratic Party in this town, you attack public education. And that's the first thing he attacked, right? The second part was around housing, right? And, you know, and, and, and really the, the tremendous gentrification on neighborhoods, the, the, the tremendous wealth and disparities that we see are part of this, this growing trend in New York City where, uh, between the haves and the haves, not the 99% versus the 1% as the Occupy Wall Street so popularly put forward. But then there's this other history that's going on too, right? And then there's this, I feel like Sandy re revealed it, and there's this, this, this unmooring of the power of Wall Street in the city. And that makes me very happy. <laughs> Wall Street, I'll say it once and I'll say it again, was built to keep the Native Americans out by the hands of African labor, slave labor. The reason that it was on the foot of the Wall Street is because the term bourgeois comes from the term burger, where the traders in between the seaports and the in inland islands, right? So when the Dutch came here, right, it was African slaves who built Wall Street. And that's how it became the center of wealth, right? Scratching out. And that center of wealth has caused the immiseration and misery of millions of people in this city. Occupy Wall Street. First, in his manifestation and in terms of his, of his occupation, and then secondly, in terms of Occupy Sandy, has illustrated in so many different ways that the, 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 the contradictions and weakening of the system. But I think that the question that we ask ourselves, you know, in this post Cold War era, in this, in this sense of, 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 in terms of us who are consider, concerned with questions around collective liberation, is what does that look like? What does collective liberation look like? Is that even possible, collective liberation? And so I think that in terms of our next steps is really kind of bringing that question and fleshing that question out. What does collective liberation look like? Can there be a collective narrative for a different type of New York City and therefore a different type of world? Because honestly, when you talk about New York City, you're talking about I hate to say it, I mean, I love the West Coast, but New York City is the world. <laughs> I'm sorry, did I say that? Okay, I'm a native New Yorker, I'm proud. You know what I'm saying? I grew up in Harlem, I live in Bronx, but when I say that, what I, what I say to mean is that New York City faces out to so many different other places, so I think that people look to us the same way that we look towards, you know, um, Cairo, or we look towards Paris, or we look towards London in different ways. It, it is one of the me bigger metropoles. So that's a question I have, and and really, what is it what we have that we can really use in terms of our vision towards collective liberation? So I think that's something that I think kind of comes to my mind in terms of our conversation post-Sandy in this current moment of, um, of, um, of political um, organizing. Wow. How do I follow up, right? Wow. Hi. So my name is Carmen Pinheiro. I'm the Sustainable Communities Organizer with Community Voices Heard. And I'm currently working on a project called Participatory Budgeting. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I just want to be able to address a couple of the issues that were highlighted here. I'm very thankful to be in a room full of a lot of people that are going to learn a lot of things. And one of the things that we do in Community Voices Heard is that we believe in shifting the debate, right? Shifting the narrative of what people are constantly and always talking about. We're gonna always have these conversations about how, you know, oh my goodness, this is the way it should be. How should we envision it? And too many times people get, put the ideas in our head and we start to frame it around what other people are saying. I think it's time for everybody to start framing conversations in the way they vision the world and how they wanna see it and recognizing that when he mentioned something, he mentioned something very important earlier that was talking about coexistence. Even in the realm of gentrification, even in the realm of everything that's happening in this world, we all have to coexist with one another mm -hmm. and we have to figure out how can we understand who we are as a people. Not as a race, not as a class, not as anything else, but people. Mm -hmm. And why do I say that? Because I listen and I try to understand. And you know what I do? 
Every day I go out into the street, I knock on people's doors. I meet different people every day and people are beautiful. Mm. People are wonderful. And people would always think that there's always gonna be somebody that's gonna slam that door and gonna look in your face and say, get out of here. And you know what? No, people are interested. Mm. I specifically work in communities, low-income communities and people of color, right? And one of the things is that a lot of people are afraid to go into a Harlem. I remember the Bronx used to be a bad word, yeah. right? 20 years ago, you said, the, I live in the Bronx. Really? What do you mean? It was like, where? Right? Where? 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 Yeah. If I said River, they'd be like, okay. No, South Bronx. Ooh. Right? But you know what? It's a community. And, and everywhere around the world, there's a set of communities, a set of people that are living, breathing, and trying to understand one another. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not you against them, it's us against each other. And it's actually a question that we have to sit back and say, how do we change that narrative where you yourself have to get all those internalized issues out of yourself to ask those questions and really talk to people about it. I mean, I want to give a shout out to Chris Westcott who's out there with those students. Yeah. They, he, bought, he bought a group of students to come visit us that are also here. And I mean, they probably went and door knocked for the very first time with me. And I could imagine that it was an experience, right? It was something different. And I challenge each and every one of you, do something different. Mm -hmm. How many of you live in your own apartments and don't know your next door neighbor? Mm -hmm. Go home tonight, knock on that door, or tomorrow, might be too late. Knock on that door and say hi. Introduce yourself. Get to know who that person is. Learn about those other cultures. And you know what's even funnier about it? I hit the streets and I talk to different people and different personalities. And they come up with different stories. Every person has a story. Every person has an experience, and every person brings something important to the table. Mm. But you want to know what I learned when it came to Post Sandy? Mm. In my community, in the South Bronx, mm. in the community that I work in, in East Harlem, mm. you know what was told to me, not once, not twice, not five times, but more than 20 times. It's funny that now the middle class learn to experience what we go through every day. Mm. Mm. Wow. So while they feel it and understand it and say, I want to go help, I want to go bring a plate of food, I want to go do this and I want to go do that, you know, as a group of people, they'll go out and they'll move to do that. And I had one person come to me with an experience and say, I went over because they were asking for people to go and cook food and cook lunches and cook dinners. And a group of people went to go do that. And they encountered a gated community that said, no, we don't want your help. Wow. So even in post Sandy, even in what was going on, even in going through and recognizing that you're dealing with things that marginalized communities deal with every single day, we were still the them. You know, they, they were, we were still the us and they were the them. There was no conversation. There was no understanding. And you know what? As we're talking about it right here and right now, how many of you have experienced being marginalized? How many of you have experienced living a different life? How many of you have attempted to coexist and understand the other group and try to actually be a part of it? Mm -hmm. So if I bring something here to the table, the only thing I can really do is tell you, I want you to work with people and understand that organizing is with passion. And if you have no passion to do it, then don't bother to do it because you have to do it with all your heart. I'm, I'm really glad that uh, you corrected you corrected the the mistake uh, um, of, uh, miss, of of um, of mentioning Chris Chris my God I mean how I just got got along I mean but the international honors program uh, it was also instrumental in organizing this uh, thank you very much Chris uh, as such um, it's over there um, I'm gonna take over and you you, you pass I, I had um, a little bit of um, a setback. I remember in 2012, somewhere in May or around that, I was writing an article that I was taking into account a lot of the, the things that were going on in many cities around the world. And I was struck by a series of things that happened in May uh, that I was reading on the same day um, in the world of our cities, of urbanization. I mean, I remember the first one was um, 
this article in uh, Vanity Fair from, by Mrs. Ambani, um, I mean, the Vanity Fair portrays this, this Indian woman, which is the, the, the wife of the richest Indian person, uh, yes, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, in power, or the richest, yeah, the most powerful guy there, um, that they had just inaugurated a $1 billion home. I mean, this is, seriously, that, that has six, needs 600 people, uh, staff, permanent staff to run it with you know, heliports, I don't know how many pools, and um, it's like how many stories, 27 story home, or something like that. Um, that very same day, I also remember reading um, an article in the New York Times about the, the record-breaking sale of the most expensive apartment in New York, which was in, uh, in one sort of a, the, actually during Sandy was the one where the crane fell. Yeah. Um, that, that building uh, is actually the most expensive building at the moment in New York. And uh, one apartment upstairs sold for $90 million. Um, and, um, and most of the, the, the apartments have sold, uh, some even argue, even more than that once that apartment uh, sold. No. At the same time, I also remember that I, that I read sort of the, it was the celebration of the first uh, public launch of Facebook, you know, the one, one, 100 million or 100, yeah, 100 billion sort of thing, a public launch of, uh, on Facebook. And at the very same time, there was also this mass protest in, in Germany, uh, in front, for the very first time, actually, in front of the European Central Bank, mm -hmm. um, which absolutely did nothing. I mean, Germany got its act together, the banks got their act together, and they basically quelled every sort of protest. There were more than 25,000 people at the time uh, protesting. It's almost like nothing happened. I mean, nothing really scratched. Also, in the same time, you had sort of the fight in Greece uh, about, um, with Syriza, remember there was this, this Greek elections that, that they were promising or some, somehow saying they were going to move out of the European Union. There was this huge crisis also uh, happening in there. And of course, at the time, the fight and the rise of this fascism that was happening um, uh, uh, over there. Now, for me, these, these sort of two days that I read all these articles kind of summarized everything that we're living in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and we can talk about our right now, you know, I mean, we have a situation where eight months after we have more obscene forms of some type of development going on you now. We have the famous inauguration of Atlantic Yards, right, very, it happened not long ago. And um, sucking money out of my money, I mean, so basically sucking blood out of all of us, life out of a neighborhood. And nevertheless, you know, attending all the celebration around that project. I, I live quite close to that, and it just, uh, it just uh, every time I go pa past there and see the amount of police that had to be put in there, you know, paid with public money, the sort of the, the all the modifications that had to happen around, and, and, and it's it just ridiculous. You have also just happening now the in Paris uh, uh, the Philharmonie. Uh, it's a project built by this famous architect uh, uh, Jean Nouvel, uh, which is called right now a 500 million bottomless pit of steel. Right, where um, a lot of public money is being placed in there, but nevertheless, I mean, this is these are the type of projects that are catching, you know, the attention of almost all the population. You know? uh, even Francois Hollande, which is theoretically speaking a socialist, where whatever that means in France, uh, uh, president, you no, know, uh, decided to go ahead with this project, which who knows um, how much is going to be. Right? I mean, that could also equal to Santiago Calatrava's station here at World Trade Center, right? The World Trade Center One or whatever that, that part is called, and. Not to talk, I mean, not only of uh, these westernized sort of parts of the world, but if we go to Brazil at the moment, you know, the dramatic changes, but highly dramatic changes that are happening um, uh, with all these World Cup and Olympic games uh, there. Not only the, the policing, the securitization of the cities, the automatization, the bots that, that Bill was just uh, mentioning on, but also the, the, the tremendous changes in the neighborhoods, in the favelas uh, that are going on in it. And, I mention all of this because one of the most important issues that I remember about Henri Lefebvre, which was the first one that brought the right to the city agenda into, into the forefront. When he was inspired um, about, uh, or what, what actually made him burst and claim uh, and shout for a right to the city was precisely because he was a clear observant. He was 
all the time, as David Harvey says, putting his eye on the crisis, mm -hmm. understanding what was going on around him. At that time, in the you know, late, early six, late 60s, early 70s, um, you had also a mess going on over there, and you know, similar to what's going on over here. You know, I had grants and samples happening. I mean, all these projects in the in the in the northeast of Paris. You had uh, huge overinvestments in public investments, high levels of um, of um, corruption in the welfare system, and etc. 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 When uh, Lefebvre goes in front and claims and says, you know, there has to be a way, um, and another way of understanding of entering the right to the city. Um, I'm going to use here the words of, of David Harvey when he interprets this text. He says, that right, that right to the city that Lefebvre assert, asserted is both a cry and a demand. Says. The cry was a response to the existential pain of a withering crisis of everyday life in the city. The demand is really a command, and I guess this is why all of us are kind of here, to look at the, at the crisis clearly in the eye and to create an alternative urban life that is less alienated, meaningful, playful, but as always, as Lefebvre said, conflictual and dialectical. Open to becoming two encounters, both fearful and pleasurable, and to the perpetual pursuit of unknowable, unknowable, knowable, unknowable, not, not known, <laughs> uh, novelty. No, which is in a way um, what I assume this type of panels so into my uh, should produce. No, these are the places where we we have first of all a right to reimagine or to imagine, and Bill put it over here to imagine um, that those other situations, those other conditions that could help us figure out ways of moving forward under this mess that I just mentioned. A very few things, but every time I'm sure that you do it, you pick up the paper and you read these things. It's, um, the way that uh, our environment is being constructed, it certainly does not include us. And I find that incredibly problematic. Mm -hmm. And um, this is, I guess, how I wanted to start sort of this sort of long leading conversation. I think a perfect entry to Frank's uh, uh, sort of statement, er, entry statement. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I was um, the, being, earlier. Yeah. Being, yeah. The, <laughs> being the dutiful student that uh, Miguel had posed the, the uh, question to me is how has the idea of the right to the city influenced me and my practice? So I came kind of having, you know what I mean when you come with that in your head and so it took me a while just to, to adjust to the conversation. Yes, in terms of, in terms of um, Sandy, we had four feet of water running down 10th Street. All our squat buildings were flooded. Um, sea squat, you, some of you might hear, was typical in terms of squatter response. Very gritty, very neighborly, very much to the point. We didn't let some flood fuck with us too much. Um, but in any case, um, in terms of the, some of the issues Miguel was raising, I ask your indulgence for my five, six minutes here worth of spieling. Um, let me say personally that uh, the, you know, the idea of the right to the city and how it's influenced me and my practice uh, is a very near and dear notion to me. Um, I'm a New York City kid, right? Um, and for those of you who are New York City kids, that, that, that means something. Um, I grew up here. Born and raised in the Lower East Side, Jacob Reese Public Housing Projects on 12th and D. Le decades later, in the late 70s, I did some squatting in the South Bronx with the people there. Beautiful experience. And then I decided to move back downtown. I was living on 139th and St. Anne's Avenue at the time to move back down to the neighborhood, now called the East Village. Um, then I recall the feeling that I had that I had a right to be there. These were my streets. I, I had memories. I saw myself running down those streets. Um, and so with scores and scores of empty vacant buildings all around, the brutal consequences of the war against the uppity poor, me and a diverse bunch of others, displaced homeless people, artists, and real live revolutionaries from all around, we worked together and seized about 30 of those build, vacant buildings and went about shaping our immediate environment. We didn't ask for permission, we just went about fulfilling our heart's desire and meeting our need for a place to live that we could afford. Now, unlike Acorn, whose strategy was to occupy and force a showdown, 
which was a good strategy, don't get me wrong, but unlike them, we made no demands. We weren't doing anything in behalf of anyone else. It was simply, we're taking this and get away. As a result, we had, to, we had to, no deals with the bosses from 1985 through 2002. A couple of dozen buildings, collectively organized and defended, which was strictly and objectively off limit to the logic of market exchange and market valuations. That's right, outside of society. We cleaned them out, defended them against the cops, lived in them. And let me tell you the transcendent feeling of being free from the twisted grip of so-called property rights, particularly in terms of where you live, well, that is a beautiful, liberating, almost inexpressible feeling that I highly recommend. Clearly outside the law, deemed criminals by three mayors, held in contempt by local government groupies, benevolent developers, short-sighted, narrow-minded hypocrites. They called us misguided and sent the cops up against us many, many times. Who gave you the right? They bellowed. And besides, you can't renovate them buildings, etc., etc. the sad bleedings of the unbelievers. Anyway, unled by any not-for-profits, politicians, or parties, we remain today still in 11 of those buildings. Weathering still, <laughs> li like so many of you in this city, the storm of greed and capitalist surplus misallocations, which in my neighborhood equaled an onslaught of thrusting, yuppie, Armageddon, Disneyland of despair like no other, <laughs> translated into spectacular gentrification and a nearly surreal disparity of wealth. It seems to me that any discussion of rights begins with a clear-headed look into what we mean by rights. I contend that whether tethered to a religious or a natural law foundation, they, rights, are at the end of the day nothing but abstractions. Empowering and inspiring visions of what could be, yes, they hover in the ether of wishful thinking. If only our true potential as a people was fully realized. But alas, that is not our reality, is it? And yet, despite that, we still insist that human rights, despite their unreality, trump the right to speculate and the tragic present, indeed, deflate that present, which is stuck in the purgatorial, this is the best that we can hope for. The point is that rights are abstractions, and they remain abstractions until they are made real, realized, incarnated in the here and now, by and with and for those who, who, whose true the true beneficiar beneficiaries of those rights, you and me, our friends and our neighbors, especially the poor and the working people. But we have to believe in that right, stick together, and step around and through the boss's bad laws. You know, back in the old days, Greece, about 500 BC, before there were cops, everyone defended each other. They came to the aid of one another. For example, if you had a wolf at the door, literally, or were the intended target for theft, or were physically threatened or about to be assaulted, you could, you would, call out to your neighbors, and at that point of penalty, they would come to your aid. That's right, 10 drachmas if you fail to heed the call of Mr. and Mrs. Stavros, who was being evicted from their home. 25 if you fail to defend the runaway slave. That's right, the notion of the you and cry derives from there. Record of these finds are delineated in recovered history, in plays, and in song. The point people defended each other. Now, the right not to be violated, which is the most basic right, requires for its realization confronting the violently enforced deprivations, exploitations, and degradations that accompany city living for poor and working class people. In this regard, we see the state violence is multiplied and operationalized in its police and militarist urban operations agendas in behalf of elite urban planners. Confronting and deconstructing this militarism at home regarding home and neighborhoods requires first identifying the telltale signs of its havoc. Easy enough, the rampant racial profiling, the prison slave camps, the displacement apparatus, FEMA, emergency management of the New York City homeless industrial complex, the non-lethal suppression of dissent, and the techno-repression of demonstrations and the jailing of subversive truths, 
all machinations of the political police in the police state in the militarized city, a condition we must come to grips, a cold urban military aspect beyond metaphor. My practice, in regards to the housing question as mentioned, has sought to realize the right to a home by way of direct action squatting. Seizing the vacant buildings as a means of seizing the time that's real and building communities of resistance, leaving behind capitalist chronologies of bad and bored survival, confident in the fact, paraphrasing Frederick Douglass, that the, mach the machine will grant no rights that we don't take. The squatters movement is, I believe, the locus of a truly alternative and revolutionary and fun politics, hatching social and organizing centers while meeting the survival needs of masses of poor. These methodologies, subversive and dangerous to tyranny, are spread across in varying character across the vast so-called developed and underdeveloped world cities. Aspects of a global vanguard of politics and poverty, necessity and desire, which is growing and that is poison to the system. Why? because capitalist modes rely on disempowering the people in their totality of rights by way of controlling their homes and their right to one, keeping us off balance, disempowered, fearful. The attack on the home is an attack on the ability to organize. Hence, the whole question of destabilization of tenure and homelessness need be seen as a counterinsurgency against the people meant to deprive masses of the ability fostered in stability to fashion a revolutionary outlook and demands, revolutionary space for organizing. In other words, paraphrasing Douglas again, give a slave a stable home and you are creating a dangerous situation. To the extent, therefore, that we're able to catalyze a militant squatter movement for a right to a home, the right to land in the city, encompassing all those suffering under the onerous usury of the banks, we can create a combative and self-assured movement that embodies the notion that squatters' rights are human rights and are an integral aspect of the right to the city, the right to rebuild, the right to reshape the city with our own hands, with our hearts on our sleeves, and with the determination to free the land by any and all means necessary. Finally, we ask, why fight for our rights? Because they are out to kill us, to kill our spirits. And in the case of the poor, their bodies as well. Why fight? Because they are wrong. They are square. Behind the times, they're violent and racist and sexist and homophobic and erosphobic and phobic phobic. Suffering the paranoia of the thief, they don't know how scared they really are. <laughs> so let us continue to fight because this city has a spirit derived from the righteous blood and sweat of a rebellious history that needs to be nurtured, respected, and adored. And that is the spirit of all the high-minded and enlightened souls, women and men revolutionaries, known and unsung, who made their lives count to make justice real, to make love among neighbors real, who knew that their human rights, though still unrealized, were real to them. So they went about speaking fearlessly and joyfully, making the word of rights flesh in the world. They live still in these streets their visions, their hopes, and most importantly, their courage and combativeness, like the furies, haunt the covetous, the cruel, and the uncaring. In closing, I would like to suggest that, as I see it, there are two roads, legal and otherwise, to achieve our ends. Committed to nonviolence, we are cognizant that the state, which incubates the injustice in the capitalist city, paying dividends to the greed machine at the top of the lopsided world, is defined by violence. Hence, employing the utmost creativity, I believe a fruitful course would be for the organizing for occupation of the vacant housing all throughout this city. Concretizing our right to rebuild this housing, our right to live in this housing, our right not to be further victimized by the predatory oppositional housing for profit system, and we can and must do so by seizing the vacant spaces. Therefore, it is time to call for a squatter uprising as a legitimate, moral, and intelligent response to the crisis. In addition to that, we must build the political and professional support for the reinstatement and reinstitutionalization of an urban homesteading program in this city, which myself and associates of the New School, Miguel and Gabriela, have recently initiated in order to create a legal 
permitted means for the accessing of these vacant spaces throughout the city. <coughs> I got one more page here. <laughs> spaces through sweat equity in the interests of poor and working class people. The ballot and the bullet. And not only for a home, as important and righteous and necessary as that is, as an end in itself, but as a means and a base of resistance within whole communities of resistance who understand that the counterinsurgency and preemptive destabilization of the masses at the grassroots by way of homelessness and tenure insecurity can only be undone when the entire machinery of capitalist social organization is sent packing by an insurgency of revolutionary proportions that facilitates the flowering of the right to the city which can benefit all the common people. A common sense revolution with folks at play in the heavenly city of our dreams, the imagined commons to come. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's a famous thing to do, actually, as a minister to say, I'm, I'm composing my ideas, and I have a six-page lecture. But I would, one, I would like, if it's possible to get a copy, and I would like, I'll put it in our reading list. I mean, it, it's something that I think we need to digest. That'd be great, no. Yeah, then we'll, we'll copy it and get it out. I want to open it up. There's some rich conversations. I know there's some details. I, I want to know what, I love the idea of, participatory budgeting, because I'm a devotee of performance budgeting, which is very similar to that. But I'm also, there are some stories, experiences, and comments, and we'll do it about 15, 10 minutes or so, and then we'll take a five minute break and then come back and continue on. So I'm gonna open it up a little bit. Anybody have some comments? No? They're still digesting, that's good. All right. Follow-ups, participatory budgeting, I'm interested in that. I think the scale question of uh, we what Frank is talking about. Well, that's the original origin of his performance budgeting. It's performance budgeting was actually, I saw one of the most amazing versions of it uh, by Mayor Shamel in St. Louis in um, mm. late 1980s. I mean, what's he, he says, what do I have? He said, I, I'm a mayor, I, he called it, I'm a, um, weak mayor in a dumb council form of government. This is, this is the situation that he was found himself um, after the 70s and the early 80s. And performance budgeting was, he got his agencies together and he said, no more trucks, we gotta pick up s uh, snow and we have to take care of the parks and then I'll approve your budget. And then but he said, but they're, they're all in four agencies. And like I said, no new trucks. So, so everybody said, what do you mean no new trucks? So somebody went out in the yard and said, you know, the sign comes off the parks and recreation truck and we can put water and sewer on that. And so they spent some money on movable signs. And the truck got to go out in the winter and the truck got to go out in the summer. Um, and the parks got clean. The other strategy had, which is the land occupation question, is to make the asset vivid. He had no budget, but he wanted to tie the city together. He bought 30,000 uh, tulip bulbs and got just hammered in the newspaper. Mayor spending money goes to Netherlands, comes back with plants. But he had them scheduled that in, the, in March, of course, when the bulbs come out. He planted them all the major arterials that were breaking down enough money to take care of the streets that connected across the towns between the rich and the poor, the north, the south, the east, the west. I mean, St. Louis is very geographically split. And he then took his most controversial pieces of legislation and put them out two weeks before all the bulbs came up in spring. <laughs> and there were 30,000 blossoms and the mayor got his vote to stop Anheuser-Busch from tearing down the center of downtown. Mm. So that question as you talk about, how do, how do we make this absolute incredible resource, the wealth, the commonwealth, it underpins New York, which is like no other city. I mean, New York is given other cities which don't have the capacity and depth and breadth. How do we foreground that asset going, whoa, we didn't know we had 30,000 
flowers out there that connected us together. So that performance budgeting is that everybody has to, in a collective way, achieve that goal in a creative way rather than saying, I, want, I need a new truck. So and like performance that. is kind of fun too. You yeah, know. I actually like so, that. Yeah. So, and this is actually the first time I've heard of that, so I'm, I'm learning something new. But when it comes... That's why we're here, the old yeah, and the new and, the and all new, that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so um, when it comes to participatory budgeting, um, let me give a little bit of background on it. It started from what we know, because we don't know, it might start even earlier, but it began in 1989 in Porto Alegre, Brazil. And what they did was that they allowed residents to decide a certain percentage of the city's budget. Now, that is definitely shifting the debate. When you really think about it, right, participatory budgeting is finally a way for real people to have a real voice in politics. Not just in politics, but in their communities. Not just in their communities, but in everything that's surrounding them and that's including their whole entire environment, right? So when participatory budgeting started there, it actually ended up spreading out to over a thousand cities and municipalities all throughout, all throughout the world, so globally. What's very sad about this is that it didn't hit the United States till a lot later. So this actually started in the United States about two years ago in Chicago with an alderman by the name of Joe Moore in the 49th Ward. Is anybody here from Chicago? Oh, so you guys started it up in US, right? And then after that, it moved on here into, into New York City and it started with city council members. The actual idea that Community Voices had was to have it work for public housing. That is still our goal. We want residents of public housing to have the capacity and the knowledge to be able to make decisions about where they live. So one way to do that is how do you do a pilot? How do you get people to understand this really works? Give people the opportunity and it really does work. So who knows here how many city council members are in New York City? 51. That's right, it's 51 city council members. In the first process of participatory budgeting, only four city council members signed on to it. A lot of people ask the question, well, why didn't everybody sign on to it? Don't you think that people should be able to use their tax dollars to decide where money goes in their communities? Doesn't that just sound awesome? I mean, it's real democracy at its best. Why would a politician say no to that? Well, how do politicians wield power? I mean... Don't say I said that. Oh, no, I'm on film. But <laughs> it's, it's, a, live it's, a, right, right. it's a live stream. You're going to so, get all 51. Oh, they're going to give me a call now. But this is a reality, right? There's always, when someone is made a politician, they're done by votes. Sometimes there are politicians that are put in place with less than 400 votes in a city council district that has an average of 165,000 residents. 400 votes. Really? Right? So here is a way finally to say, even though you are in power, give back some of that power to residents. See what is it that they have to say. So in participatory budgeting here, we started this off with those four city council members that were amazing. It was District 8, Melissa Mark Viverito, Jumani Williams, Eric Ulrich, and Brad Lander. That's who started off. Now we're up to eight. So we 100%, one year, four city council members. This year now we have eight city council members. And each of them are giving a million dollars to their communities so that they can decide how to spend money. Right. right? And that is amazing. We are hoping that all 51 city council members would eventually try to do that as well. And that of course would be talking to the future mayor that's coming in. Because what happens is that the mayor provides something called discretionary funding to the city council speaker who's currently Christine Quinn. That city council speaker then distributes that money amongst the 51 city council members. But they receive a range of discretionary funding that is from anywhere between $3.5 million up to $11 million mm. at the discretion of the city council speaker. Now, do you think that's a fair process? So the city council speaker can, it's not because of need or demand or because of the community, but instead it's because, well, this city council member, yeah, I'll give him 3.5. This one, I'll give him 11. This one right here, her, we'll give you five. So it's not really a fair process how it's coming out. So what we did was say, well, can you give the residents $1 million? One, 
because at least you can give that minimum. And from that process, it's moved forward. Every one of these districts has something called neighborhood assemblies. In these neighborhood assemblies, residents of the community come together to troubleshoot and discuss ideas about what they vision for their communities. The only nuance with this is that it's specific to capital infrastructure projects, which means it's only for building or fixing things, right? It's not for a program. It's not to have um, a new, a brand new school, because can a million dollars build a brand new school? No, it's about also teaching residents about a budgeting process. Budgeting is making very difficult decisions that sometimes we have to recognize that we have to prioritize what are the real needs of a community. And what this process did within these communities is that it united different geographical areas. I can specifically speak on District 8, which is Melissa Mark Viverita's district, that actually has three separate and distinct areas. It has El Barrio, right, which is Spanish Harlem. It has Manhattan Valley, which is a small portion of the west side, which is a little bit more affluent. And then it has the Mott Haven section of the Bronx, which is about 10 to 15 city blocks and not too big. But it has the, lot, the highest concentration of public housing. In these neighborhood assemblies, one of the examples that I can definitely give is that there were people talking about we haven't had an elevator for the past month. I live on the 22nd floor. How am I going to get downstairs to go to work or go to school? Then you had someone from the west side say, well, I want this school, this specific charter school, to get more books. But they already have books, but we want them to get these specific books. When they started having these conversations, they were like, well, wait a second. We need books, but you need a way to get to and from somewhere or live go to the doctor there's an emergency there's something happening they had to really recognize the needs of other communities and prioritize to actually see you can can you ever sit back and ever watch somebody listening to something and then they have this little light bulb and they have that aha moment it was like an aha moment of recognizing that other people have different needs and money that's getting distributed is not but so much and we have to make sure that the needs of these communities that don't have it, get it. You have public housing on one side, you have regular buildings on the other side. Some more affluent, some less affluent, some low income, some whatever. They recognize that over here, they don't have any lighting and we wanna make sure that they're okay. They said, well, let's give them some lighting and they put those down in those projects. So this process, it creates transparency, it creates accountability, it creates equity, like, equitable solutions, and you know what's even better about it is that it starts making other people aware that these needs are really in the community. Another example is the fact that there were 29 ballot ideas for, for East Harlem, for the eighth, um, District 8. Out of those 29 ideas, you could only pick five, so the top five were funded. There were other ideas that were on it that were amazing, that were great, but unfortunately didn't make the cut. In Douglas Houses, one of the public housing complexes, they had a basketball court that was horrible. That basketball court ended up getting done by the PAL, the Police Athletic League. So even though it didn't get funded one way, it got funded a different way because they recognized here's a need in the community. So there's, it's a wonderful experience. I challenge you and I tell you if you haven't had that experience to go out and see what a neighborhood assembly looks like to go out to one. They just recently ended. We're going to come up onto the neighborhood expos where people get to see what ideas are coming out of this. Because from those neighborhood assemblies, those ideas, re regular people just like you and me, will stand up and become budget delegates. Budget delegates, they actually sit there and go through each and every one of these proposals to see what's feasible, how many people are going to benefit from it. They hit the streets, take pictures of it, look at it, and are really and truly invested in a volunteer capacity. They're doing that for free. Then they come back, they chop them down, they put them on the ballots, and before the ballots, they go to an expo where people in the neighborhood get to see them and give their ultimate ideas so that they can tweak them. Then they pick their five ideas, the money comes into the neighborhood. But we know bureaucracy is slow. So while we've already finished one cycle, we're still waiting for the money to come and implement it so that we can monitor it. So that's participatory budgeting in a nutshell. I try to do it as fast as possible, but it, it's a lot of information, okay? We seem to be on a roll. This, this is a favorite topic of mine. I've worked in infrastructure for a long time, trying to get the public side out of the engineer's hands. It's clever. Okay, you've got a trained group of people who really know how to do this. How do you then go from this, I would say, first phase, 
it's a great sort of incubator. But, you know, if you keep doing it, you know, they'll say, we can't get rid of that neighbor. We'll give them some basketball courts. You know, it's just get them all busy. Meanwhile, another $150 million, $250 million is being spent by the Public Works Department, which is digging up the road 16 times to put one pipe in it. And you're going, why, why are they doing that 16 times? Well, they just haven't got their subcontractors lined up. Oh, why? Well, you know, it's hard. Mm -hmm. I, I've done, had these meetings, and it's, it, they say it's hard. Mm -hmm. I went, well, okay. So hard costs an extra $1.5 million, right? Yeah. Mine. Mm -hmm. so, 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 I mean, how do you take that experience and sit down with the council member and the agencies to basically get them aligned to work together? Because if you dig down in the bureaucracy, there's some passionate people that love the city. I know Parks and uh, McKinney and a lot of other people love it down there, but you know, they've got to go up through the, the speaker. Mm -hmm. So the question is, they already have their budget. The question is utilization of the funds. Now they love keeping it under capital and not actually have any operation, which means you can have a light that goes with the basketball court, mm -hmm. right? Or somebody actually guard it. Um, so uh, so you, you, you go inside and say, well, why can't we do this to everything that's going through where we, every investment that goes to basic utility is also enhancing our lives. And two things happened when we did this in actually crazy place, city of Phoenix, which is not exactly the liberal hotbed of the world. In the 80s, it was a little better than it is now. Two things happened. People were demanding to have their street torn up next. It was like, wh what? Because they knew they could participate and they would have a better, safer life afterwards. Yeah. And they started painting their houses, cleaning up their houses, pick up the trash, because the city says, we care what you're doing, and they saw it integrated together. So it seems to me that you're building up such a knowledge that you could facilitate and break down the mechanisms that have built up over, encrusted over the last 30 years. I mean, that's what's happened. I mean, yes, yeah, New York, but it's encrusted with New Yorkness, mm. right? And, it, and you know, it's kind of, kind of like chip some of that stuff off mm. and get into it. So, I mean, you've got some skill base here that then shows, because if you can go back to the city council member and says, you know, you know that, that project, we proved it six months shorter, no attorneys, everybody loves it, and you get to cut a ribbon five <laughs> times. Ooh, two more of those. So I mean, that's a there's a real sort of passion of the question of scale and taking your skill. Yeah. I mean, I, I, one of the things that uh, that uh, I recall reading recently about this uh, budgeting sort of redistribution, I would say, I don't know if you read the um, hundred million dollar donation they gave uh, Paulson gave to Central Park uh, also a few months ago, right? And there was this debate about uh, why. Right, I mean that money, a hundred million dollars. There's so many parks there. Why does Central Park, you know, have to have that hunt, which is a lot of money for a park? Mm. And and there was some slight discussion on how to redistribute that budget, right? But at the end, of course, there was you know some people that got the decision that you know, and Paulson, I'm sure that would have said, if it's not for Central Park, I take the money out or mm. something like that. No, but then you have, of course, incredibly privileged areas on one side, and um, which is this type of donation, especially in the American system, and then others that are not. Now, I remember that one of the biggest fights that I got into this participatory thing um, when I got the luck of teaching in Switzerland, which I recall Switzerland, and a lot of people refer to Switzerland. I'm moving far away as one of the places where direct democracy is in action. Right? I mean, at least this is what we hear, of course, produced by bankings and all these sort of things, but nevertheless. And um, over there, you actually, if you get enough people signed up, you can actually create a law that if people vote on it, it becomes a law. I mean, one ridiculous law that was put forward not long ago either was uh, there were some people that said, okay, um, whether or not you're employed or unemployed or you want to work or not want to work, all Swiss people are entitled to 4,000 Swiss francs a month. And uh, actually people said, a lot of people signed in and people got to vote that law, right? And it would have been law if that would have gone on further. Now, when I saw the limit of this, and this was one of the biggest debates we had with, um, with the organizers in Switzerland, believe it or not, there are organizers there. They have the most amazing, actually, May Day parade uh, still going on in it. Uh, was that Switzerland allowed people to vote in everything except on what to do with the money. <laughs> so uh, you, you can vote, you know, if you want to 
you know, whatever you want. I mean, if you make it happen, make it happen. But it's a, if it's time of, you know, what are you going to do with the millions and trillions of laundered money that go into, you know, there? Nobody gets to vote on that. You know, that's actually the place where it's totally sealed. You know? Now, in the case of, 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 uh, of um, Brazil, you know, on the first examples uh, that you mentioned, you always had um, a certain amount of budget was allocated for people to take decisions on their business, which is a great advance. And what you guys are working on, it's a great advance. But in, in, always, in my head, I always pass, like, as Bill was saying, what happens to the $50 billion that FEMA you know, is doing? Who's deciding on that, right? And which those are like serious, uh, you know, th those are the, th the things that are producing the city, right? I mean, the, in a way, $1 million, it's going to produce changes, obviously, but still we haven't touched sort of the fibers of how to, you know, really get along with all the rest of the money that has been invested. And not only that, but even having a say on how to redistribute the budget, which is why I want to go back to these $100 million that Paulson donated to Central Park. Um, are we also having a say on that redistribution of the budget, which is incredibly important? No, it's not only the, 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 that we have the budget to do whatever we want, but okay, there's a budget there and it's clearly being misused, mismanaged. And the more I walk into New York City, the more we see it. And, and it, the cross section of walking from, from lower Manhattan all the way to East New York, uh, if someone actually manages to do that in a day, you really figure out, I mean, again, you're aware of actually how that redistribution is. Um, the millions and uh, almost billions of dollars that the, the, the Calatrava station, Fulton Station is costing. While, I, I mean, I'm sure that you go to your stations most of the time and they're falling apart, right? Mm -hmm. So we have one incredible showpiece where capital is accumulated with, you know, there's high concentration of surplus that has a certain, you know, reason to exist because of course attracting more investment and producing more money for those bankers or those sort of real estate people. But nevertheless, our decisions on, on whether or not it's actually worth it to spend $1.5 billion in a station, whereas, the, you know, half of the other stations are falling apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I guess that this is really a, a very important thing to take on. I mean, as things move on with this $1 million thing, which is a really incredible great step ahead for the, for the United States, right? But it's about I think, how the hell do we manage you know, to get into pushing those uh, redistribution sort of discourses? Uh, so. I'll try and be quick. No, no, we, um, we're, 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 we have time? we're gonna probably finish early and because we started early, but let, I don't wanna break it because of okay. the conversation, unless anybody wants. Um, so Right to the City is part of the Participatory Budgeting Board. I sit on the board of the project that's a national project here in the United States. And the board makeup is actually beyond just Americans. There's a rep from Brazil, someone from London, from France, and then a whole bunch of Americans. And it's part of the conversation and the challenge that exists in this board process when we're examining and figuring out how participatory budgeting rolls out further within New York and then beyond New York. So you know, the notion of the right to participate in your de democratic making structures is one of the pillars of the right to the city conversation. Um, and while the expansion of this process in the United States is a beautiful and wonderful thing, it's, it's fraught with all kinds of challenges. I mean, for one thing, we've got discretionary monies from city council people um, that can only be used towards capital projects. So there's all kinds of limitations going all around. And it's a brilliant way to ensure that you're reelected. And you know, nothing, I, I, I adore the city council people who've stepped up. I think it's a very brave thing that they've done. I think part of the reason why more city council people have elected not to do so is because the process that Carmen started to talk about is actually, it's not the sum of money, it's the process that people are engaging. This transformative process that brings together different sectors of the community to actually have conversation and see each other eye to eye and talk about what matters to their hearts and minds and their families. It's the process that is a dangerous thing because when you've done that for a million dollars, well shit, I want all of the discretionary funds to move this process. And you know what? I want the full city council budget. And let's talk about New York. Why is the process of budgeting in New York shrouded in mystery and under the cover of, you know, uh, uh, a wonky speak and legalese when we're talking about the expenses of dollars 
that affect our everyday lives, that affect the health and well-being of our, our homes and our children and, and you know what it is that we need and do to thrive. And so these are some of the questions that are coming up in the board process. We had a board meeting today, and one of the conversations was, well, who do we accept money from? Because believe me, there are lots of corporations that want to throw money at this because, oh, we support democracy in the United States. MetLife, we just gave $30,000 to the participatory budgeting process. And what is that do to water down the 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 intention behind wanting to bring something like this to the United States and actually have it be about more than a kinder gentler capitalism right so these are conversations that are happening in New York the process is actually moving in Vallejo California now two of rights to the city's organizations are part of moving it and with drastically different communities uh, immigrant communities who for whom you, you have no idea the process of getting an immigrant community to trust that this is okay and that exposing yourself to this and being out there in a very public way is okay and you are invited and you are welcome and this process belongs to you is totally different than doing it in a city like New York. Not to say that there's not immigrant populations in New York, but uh, um, where the process is moving, the with many of the immigrant communities are more deeply uh, grounded and have deeper roots within the process of the, of, of the community that they're in already. Um, Boston is another city, and Puerto Rico. So, you know, it's about to spread to Puerto Rico. And there, there are two paths. It, it can either become a mechanism for uh, people feeling like, well, we share in this piece of the pie, and so there's no real reason to push beyond these boundaries. Or it can become a mechanism that has people understand that these things are not super mysterious. I mean, I said to Frank, well, you have to do budgeting, right, you guys. I mean, you're homesteaders. You have to get together and figure out how does the collective budget of our homesteading get spent? Where does it get applied? What are our priorities? There's nothing wildly radical about that notion. We do it in our families. You pull together a collective budget. I do it for my organization. We have conversations about how the budget is gonna get spent. But there, we, we live in a culture where we are taught that you need a degree to participate in that. Or you need to be chosen by particular individuals to be worthy enough to participate in that process. And it's just not true. Let me ask something, Frank. The, the question of principles and planks and the next generation is that there was uh, Jerry Brown, the governor out there in California, eliminated redevelopment authorities uh, in all the cities. And I'm wondering what a, one of the planks of the next generation of thinking is the elim elimination of all public dollars to private sector development at city level. I mean, it, it didn't exist at a certain point. I mean, it really came on in the 1980s, but essentially public dollars are not used to underwrite real estate. That's one reason why the budget process is shrouded, because they're sorting out how much is left for the public sector. But I'm this sort of principle. Go ahead. Well, I mean, I think if I understand your question, generally speaking, the, the privatization um, penchant is uh, pervasive and increasing, so it doesn't surprise me yet that, you know, there will be no public left at the end of the day as far as these people are concerned. But I'm, I was wondering, in terms of New York City, and I'd be interested in, you know, you guys that are participating in this, um, whether or not there's a, a democratic mode tactic that might be employed to bring about more de democratic participatory um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the budget, like ballot initiatives or stuff like that. Um, has that been thought about? You know, a ballot initiative which would delineate, you know, what, in other words, reimagining the, the budgetary process in New York City put forward in the form of a, of a ballot initiative that the citizenry can vote on. Because um, you can, you know, if you get... I don't know how many signatures you need, but you know you need a certain 10,000, 15,000 signatures or something to put something on on a bat on a on a. But what the mayor has done every time that has happened, tried to happen, he trumps it by putting on a charter revision amendment, and he kicks off anything that people have done. This mayor has so much power 
that he won't let anything like that get on there. Mm. New mayor. I, we, we, I, I feel like we're missing an entire part of the conversation that we should be covering right now. And that's the fact that we have more billionaires in this city than anywhere per capita in the world. Emma Goldman fam famously said, go up Fifth Avenue and take what's yours. We have families in this city that have several generations of people who do not work, who do nothing. They take on vanity projects. They don't contribute to society. They think they do. Perhaps in their circle of friends they do, but in reality they don't. We still have children that are starving in East New York. We still have daycare centers that are being closed every day. I mean, and this is the world that we live in, in which you, know, you just go up Fifth Avenue and you will go from the most expensive real estate in the country to crack houses within five minutes, 10 minutes, and a bus ride. That's inexcusable. This is unsustainable. And you know, we talk about participatory budgeting, but really, we're the mouse scratching over the scraps that have been left off the table. We're not looking at the real resources. It's not just the right to the city. It's the right to the resources that the city has. And we have more billionaires in this city than anywhere per capita in the world. And if you don't think we have capital here to take care of every citizen of New York City in the tri-state area, you're just not paying attention. And that's the larger conversation. I think we're really challenged right now with the information that we have to really go after. I mean, it's incredible to empower our community so that when you know, we get to that point, we can do that. But our major challenge right now is to figure out how to flip this unsustainable system that we're in, where we have these individuals like John, uh, John Paulson, you know, like Stephen Schwartzman, who gave $100 million to the New York Public Library a couple years ago. You know, they're shoveling our economy into their pockets. And it's going to be gone, and we're not going to see it again, and we're going to be in a much worse situation in 10 years. So, yeah. But well, what does it take? I don't know. Right. We're here to talk about that. Mm -hmm. I think in part, um, I think Priscilla on, on is, is completely correct in regards to, you know, they're shoveling the economy into our pockets, and we're never going to see that again. I think it's also important to remember that that is part and parcel of the four to 600-year history of capitalism as a system. Um, and I think that one of the questions that we really have to ask ourselves is, you know, historically, cities exist as a tenant of industrialization. You know, you put 80,000 workers in one plant, you know, and they work three shifts a day, and, you know, you, they, they have families, and those people center around a particular geographic location. What does the city mean? What purpose does the, does the city serve? after industrialization. What is the purpose of a post-industrial city? And I think that in part, the, the, the participatory budgeting thing, uh, the, the process that, that, that we've just been talked about as well as uh, Frank's comment about the ballot initiatives and, and Rochelle's comment about why particular city council people have not agreed to participate in participatory budgeting, I think is, is very, very important for us. I mean, if we take this question of what is the purpose of a post-industrial city seriously, which I think we have to do, I think that part of what we'll find is that we, we, we live in a country in which we have, we have lived for the past 250 years as though technological and economic development would solve all our problems. This clearly has not solved any of our problems, but in fact created all of our problems and created problems for folks around the world. We have to ask ourselves, is there an area in which people in the United States are in profound need of development? Because it's not economic development, it's not technological development, but we are in profound need of development in regards to political development and the development of skills that allow us to make decisions that are both politically and socially responsible for our collective coexistence. And I think that Rochelle's point about why it is that participatory budgeting is not, as it relates to the, to, to the process, you know what I mean? If you participate in developing a budget, you develop a set of confidence that this country does not breed in you. Schools beat it out of us, our jobs beat it out of us, 
advertising, marketing, everywhere we walk, the power, the innate creativity that human beings have is beat out of us. And I think the question we have to ask ourselves in the participatory budgeting as an example is incredibly profound. Because the question becomes, where do human beings develop a sense of our capacity to run our own cities, to run our own communities? Right. As Miguel pointed out, right, the million dollars is a drop in the bucket. There's a whole lot of other money out there. So the question that I think that, that, that we, especially those of us committed to organizing, have to ask ourselves in what area, in what projects can we begin to do that instill, that, that facilitate, right, the reclaiming of that human creativity? What projects can we build, can we develop that help us all develop the skills necessary to make the kind of responsible, the politically responsible decision making that comes with, particip with part participatory budgeting? PD. Thank you. PD is what I'm going to say from here on. Uh, and, and, and I ask this um, because this is something we can all do, right? If you have children, Right. Make the finances public. How do we decide how to do this? Right. If you live on a block that, that you know, that, that, that has room for a garden, you pull together the block and say, how do we want to use this space? If you live in Brooklyn, Google three, 365 acres dot com. There are 365 acres of vacant land in the borough of Brooklyn. Is it 365, 356? As you can see, my numbers, feet, and miles are bad. It's a whole lot of acres in Brooklyn um, that are available, right? We have to begin to think ourselves, how do we create the space in which we can develop the skills necessary to build a new city? Because when people believe that we are capable and believe that it is our right to have the city, we're going to find collective ways to figure out how we can get access to that $100 million that, part that, that PB doesn't give us access to. And I think in many ways, we have to begin to raise this question about how do we, outside of PB, in, or in addition to PB, I'm sorry, develop the leadership skills of everyday people. I just want to be able to respond a little bit because I'm not going to lie. I got triggered and, and I'm going to say why, right? I'm going to say exactly why. Again, it goes to that notion of you have to walk in these communities first to understand that even that spit in the bucket never happened before. If I never got a penny from you and you all of a sudden said here, I'm going to sit back and say, well, how do I work on that? And then the first thing I'm going to say is you're lying. Because it's never happened before. Mm -hmm. So I imagine, yes, we may have some of the most largest and biggest, beautifulest and most boldest visions. But the reality is, is that it's a very few amount of people willing to stand up and do that work. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm going to tell you right now, it always takes someone to fall for everybody else to rise. Mm -hmm. And no one understands that unless you live it, breathe it and do it. Because we can always talk about how everybody else is living and what we should expect and want more. But you don't know that you can get and expect and want more if you haven't seen that. First show them the picture and then start expanding those minds. Mm -hmm. When that starts to happen, then we can sit back and say, you know what? Now I want more. Because guess what? We are human and human nature is greed. It's greed in certain ways, and that's why I have to say it in a negative and a positive, right? Under cap yeah, under capitalism, we'll see it as a negative. But human nature is, I want more. When I first started going to school, I wanted more knowledge. I wanted to keep going to school because I realized that this opened certain doors. And then I realized that if that person next to me can't afford to go to school, then it's my job to then teach that person what they didn't know. And I think it's very different that we can sit back and we could judge. But you think that the person who makes a billion dollars might know that there might be another difference? They're still human beings. You don't know if they're perfect, if they're not perfect, if they know any better, if they didn't know any better. How about those that were born with the silver spoon in their mouth, right? Even Socrates in the age of Socrates, who were his students? Mm -hmm. Who were his students? The rich, kids, right? 
So think about that. You have to start imagining these conversations, and it's true. Start opening up the conversations and recognizing that there are billionaires in the world. They're going to be there now. They're going to be there tomorrow. They're going to be there 100 years from now. Right? It's not questioning how do we take your millions of dollars, but instead questioning how do we get you to change that conversation to know that use your millions of dollars to help create better communities. Give more of that wealth out and distribute it evenly. That's all I mean by that. And I'm sorry if I... Yeah. I mean, that's what we're looking at. That's what they want. They want a philanthro-capitalist world. You know, we're sitting in this auditorium because Stephen Kellen gave a gift to the new school after he had probably several development people go and beg him for it. That's why we're sitting here today. Is that the world that we want for our kids? I don't. Well, yeah, I'm very grateful for Stephen for... Uh, um, <laughs> But in terms of bridging, this in is terms good, good. Yeah, this is good. <laughs> we want this. That's in, why I wear the red. In, ter in terms of bridging, what it is that um, what we're saying here, I think there's a bridge, which is that um, maybe you know, I, you know, I, I worked, for instance, with a lot of tenants in the past, and as you all know, anybody's done any kind of tenant work and so forth and so on. Most tenants are unaware of their rights. Yes. Right. They get a letter in the mail from the owner saying you have 30 days to leave and so forth and you know 50 percent of the people are ready to pack in their bags and you say no 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 the owner can't evict you you have to be evicted by a court and you know there's a process the, the landlord can't evict you see so most tenants are so part of i think the the role of right to the city and those of us who engage in this process which then becomes a bridge between you know the organizing, the day-to-day -day bringing to a certain point and the occupation of City Hall um, is to teach people about their rights. I think most people are not aware or have lost the ability to sense that they have a right to the city. Right. So what are, what are those rights? What, you know, like, like think in terms of bringing that bringing that out in people so that they have a sense of, uh, of you know, yeah, I'm entitled to this. I think that's what, where we've gotten. So I think we should spend some time bringing that to people and as a way to build our, the, the mass so that eventually we can occupy City Hall um, and create the kind of uh, democratic processes that, that will allow us to alleviate our, you know, our suffering. Oh wow, I feel like I should be in the audience because it's so amazing. No. <laughs> I'm like, ooh, good point. I mean, you know, this I mean I mean this I mean there's so much here I want to say. I mean, first of all, I mean I was like I think I was like I mean I was like twenty seven when I realized the New York Public Library wasn't really public. And it's is owned by the Ash the Tip Lennox Tilden Foundation. And so there was this whole type of thing where you have this public 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 private partnership that controls city resources in the city and it's very nebulous in terms of the way we deal with it. And that's why a lot of times a lot of the people who used to work in the post department and get nice union wages have been pushed out in favor of people who work in workfare. Right? And so that, that question around public private needs to be conversated on and really understood. I think another part of it too is this whole type question of like like what is materialism, right? And I think that's a question within the context of like like, you know, I was raised, I was raised and I also went to UCLA, the university on the corner of Lexington Avenue, Hunter College, and, and. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and with Michelle and Lenina, and um, studied philosophy and black studies, and my parents were like, you're not trying to get a job. I was like, no, I'm not trying to get a job. Um, but, um, but I work at a Brecht form now, it works out. You know, anyway, hi. Um, but. Um, the thing that I'm thinking about was that was this this question of like 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 you know I was a lot of the teachers used to say well if things get bad enough people will automatically revolt you know what I'm saying and like you know and what we found out was that when things get bad enough people tend to get more and more conservative you know and so the thing the thing that we as activists and thinkers I think was struggling with is how to activate the mass to get them involved into 
you know, agitated, right? And I think there's, there's a couple of things that really go, in, go into it. One is that question of a, of a new type of materialism. You know, there was a time when people said, when, you know, you press down on somebody, they're going to rise up and lead. And I think that, no, that gets exhausting. I think people kind of pull back, you know? And I think that people want a situation where, like, I think you said something about the greed, which I think is really interesting. I would call it new needs, right? The manufacturing of new needs, you know, saying so, like, it's kind of sensual materialism, you know, saying, like, I tell people the difference between uh, a socialist vision and a capitalist vision is capitalist vision is very slick and socialism is fly. You know what I'm saying? And I think that's the question of like, how do we get to the flyness? You know? And yeah, you know, and so like, how do we bring out the flyness? Like, like Havana, 1966, like Che was working really hard, 15 hours a day in, in the sugar field. And, but there's a sexy flyness, right? He's going to chest this, you know, the sex is coming down and, you know, young, you know what I'm saying? Bad, bad economic planning too, but sexy. And so, like, I think this thing around being able to understand the question of leisure, right, right, as, as, in terms of, as, as part of this materialism is also part of this question that Matt raises around what is the post-industrial city. My thing about it is if we're going to have a city which is going to border near to, you know, in black communities and brown communities, 70% unemployment, you know, we have, two, we have two options. One is we just give our children up to the, to the prisons, both the schools and the prisons upstate. Mm -hmm. Or we find the ability to put them to work right. in a whole entire different way. You know, and, you know, and, and, you know, and, 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 you know and, and I think that that's a question. And I think that also brings back to the question of how do we create different forms of resources, right? You know, in, in, you know, and so I think that is a co-joint. I think it has to be a, a, a dual strategy of both in terms of agitation, what happened in terms of Occupy Wall Street, but also this other strategy too that's pushing back. And I think that the biggest thing is that the organizers and the activists haven't been talking to each other for a very long time. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And we need to start having that conversation again. You know, we need to be in a room together and be like, you know, like, you know, I'm dropping into the scene, I'm trying to get a, I'm trying to get a community agitated, but we need, like, sisters and, like, you know, and comrades to be like, look, you know, this is the way we have a long-term vision of 15, 20 years, yes. you know what I'm saying? And we need to start having that conversation again. Yes. I think that's part of the thing, too. So one is taking a snapshot of what is the, the absolute clarity of the instant at this moment. What is similar? A long struggle. But what are the variables that are radically different? Because you're having activists and organizers coming together with a huge population of energy that maybe wasn't there, was there differently 20 years ago. And I think this, you're getting on some really important points. What's absolutely unique, I mean, so clear that no one can push it away. And it's very broad and deep, and it crosses over. We're gonna, I'm pushing towards summary, but this is very good. Oh. You're doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I just wanted to add that uh, when when you say Kasemba that that we need to get you know these people together, etc. I think in this room it's uh, something is happening, and hope I'm, I'm, I'm sure something will happen out of this. I mean, this this room um, is bringing some people together, and this is a start. I mean, I'm, we've started so many times also, but um, uh, <laughs> hopefully we have a continuation. Um, but I I'm actually eager uh, to to hear some comments. Perhaps you're already. And, and opinions you're already charged uh, back there, um, and uh, I don't know how you want to handle the rest. Minutes. I, I I will uh, take about 15 minutes of questions. I will. Hey, I'm going to run around and play Mr. Mike. We have a question up front. It's easiest. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so, I guess I'm pulling on three ideas that I heard um, that were really kind of inspiring you. No, but they come together. They come together. And so they're going to be one. So we've got participatory budgeting. Uh, we've got this idea of the Occupy media and the role of media um, in kind of bringing the Occupy movement together. And then maybe I'm pulling it out of context, but this idea that you brought up of the internet of things, of a knowledge, my knowledge that cannot be taken away from me. Right, that there is something that cannot be taken away from me. So I was wondering if someone, if you could speak to this connection between participatory budgeting and the media. Maybe that's 
um, and new media, whether it's using different forms of online to do this participatory budgeting, or is there a connection there, do you think, that we could use um, to kind of bring people together around financial issues to kind of take something back? I don't know. All our money went into this building, we only have one mic. <laughs> Um, it's a good question. It's a complicated question, I think, uh, because even in the PV process, the internet as a medium serves a particular gender, age, like right, a particular demographic. Um, the New York Steering Committee's got lots of um, individuals and organizations and some some resource allies, people uh, or organizations like the Urban Justice Center um, who do participatory research and really document the process as it moves. But there's also, um, I hate that I don't remember his name. Um, there's a gentleman who comes from a multimedia organization who's very interested in using the, the medium of media and the internet to encourage and provide alternative spaces for people to engage the process. So you can submit project ideas online. Um, last year's process, we, we did not allow for the vote to take place online, but it's possible that we would move towards uh, people being able to vote virtually, voting online. You can engage, there was a, a platform for a conversation or a debate around some of the projects that can take place online. Um, you know, I think as more and more generations have the internet and computers ingrained in the fabric of everything they do, it's amazing how it's even happened to me. My stepdaughter printed out a project yesterday and she had to annotate um, a song for English and she annotated in writing and I found myself saying, are you allowed to do that? And I was like, oh my God, what's wrong with you? Right, but so as this medium becomes more and more ingrained in, in what we do and how we move, I think it's gonna become a really important and dynamic uh, thing to figure out and talk about in relation to how we organize, how we educate, how we look at um, the construction of the city and engaging the fight or the battle um, around the city. I'll say that Lenina for Right to the City has been an instrumental uh, component for teaching us to always think about the media angle, the audience, the internet, you know, this medium in terms of how we use it as a tool to do our organizing work and, you know, stuff that I'm just like, well, we'll write a flyer and everyone's going to go and we'll hand it out and, exactly. right? Isn't that how you do it? Um, so it's a good question and I think it's developing and it's moving. Um, yeah, and the, and and there's there's a lot more that can be done with it. It can be marginalizing and alienating for certain communities now, but I think ten years from now that won't that won't be the case. So, one of the things is that we are a member-led organization. So my bosses, I have two bosses with me here, and um, I just wanted to be able to introduce them as well. So I have Lorraine Knox right here, and. Um, Flanoy, Flanoy Withers as well, third. And they're, they're members of our constituency and they work really hard in trying to make participatory budgeting work and they also trying to help us out with public housing. And I know Flanoy wanted to make a, a short a comment as well. And so I just wanted to pass the mic to him for a moment, please. Thank you. Thanks everybody, I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm getting kind of warm. Not because of the heat, and I'm not too sure how you're going to receive my remarks, but because tomorrow starts what we call Black History Month, and, and because it was mentioned made as to how Wall Street, I was also down in Zuccotti Park, and I was also one of those who made sure that you understood that the African burial ground is there, and you know. Um, what do I really want to say to you? I guess when we see this city, and we see it from Martin R. Delaney, to Frederick Douglass, until now, 
whether we should take an integrationist mode, behavior path, or whether this should be more nationalistic. One of the main things we want people to do is to understand American history. When I found out about them burning down on the two libraries in Timbuktu, it hurt. Hurt because our artifacts, the depositories of our legacies that have made us proud for those of us who feel emotionally satisfied when we think of our African past, when we all oh, who we smile and we say that y'all don't know about Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. And when we understand that, you always said, no, you don't have any history. That's why we made you slaves, because you didn't write anything down. And we knew that in Timbuktu, we had people who had thousands of books in their libraries, and that we, we were able to chronicle and to write down what we did sub-Sahara. But now it's, it's gone. It's, it's being taken away. But you talk about New York City, and I heard you speak about various aspects, but you didn't talk about redlining. You look at Harlem now, <sighs> banks in almost every corner. You're talking about the housing stock and the way it was. I'm so sad in 1980 when my friends were trying to get me, come on, Flannoy and Ma, let's get these buildings, buildings going for a dollar. Well, we couldn't get the loans to get it, but y'all can, anybody can. Come from anywhere, come up here, you get the loan, you get the building. People in the area think you're rich. You ain't rich. You wasn't rich. You just got it. We didn't have it. One of the main things that I went to a, uh, a mayor reform last night. It was held at, uh, what's the school at 23rd Street and Lexington Avenue? Right. It was, it was uh, five of the mayor candidates were there. One of them said something going to stuck with me. He said that he would put a tax on those who make a million dollars or more, that's about $2,000. With that, he would make sure that there would be pre-K for every child for the whole year. Pre-K, and then there would be three hours for the after-school programs. All right, that is what he said he would do, which touched my heart. It was great because I have a grand niece, pre-K. She's five. She goes to a school where the tuition is $22,000 a semester. She pays $200, right? But I know she is, she's in a good place. She's learning. But it has to be for more other than them. Uh, I live in a house in development. I do voter registration. I try to deal with the problems of my people. The only place where the young people in the South Bronx area can congregate is the library. There is no community center. There is no senior center. There's a precinct. One of the main things that the police do is to spy and see anybody with a brown bag. There is no problem with them just simply stopping anybody. If you're standing outside of your building, you will get a ticket, and your ticket is your ticket is for lottery. Your ticket is for being in a known, a known, a known crime place, which is your building, and you're just coming outside or going inside. And you must go and take this to the court to fight it, because the whole thing is about getting everybody's names, throwing everybody on the wall, intimidating people. Again. There is no, there is not one black store or business in my area of the South Bronx, not one. We are all people who like to talk. We can only congregate either on the corners where we are at or around the stores. Uh, I was going somewhere when I started this. <laughs> so wherever I have ended up, <laughs> I think I will stop there <laughs> until something else. Hits, hits me. <laughs> okay. Thank you, man.
Yeah, it was great being here tonight. And you speak of black, black history. And the thing about it, it connects to the internet. Because the thing about it was that, you know, when Arturo Schomburg, who happens to be an Afro-Puerto Rican, started the Schomburg Library, he was not saying, I want to create something in the cloud. He was like, I want to create something in real life. Right, and it started with books, right? And it's a real institutional space that reproduces intellectual life in the city. When Occupy Wall Street happened, what was the first thing they built? They built a library. You know what I'm saying? They built an the intellectual space to produce intellectuals in the city, right? So, that is to say, tomorrow it happens to be Langston Hughes' birthday, right? And for those of you who know, Langston Hughes was a very prominent black queer poet in Harlem who, you know, who, who lived a simple life. You know, saying he, he lived in a one bedroom apartment in Harlem, lived amongst his people, started 129th Street. 129th Street, exactly. Started, started a library among, for his, started a community garden, you know, with children, you know, amongst his people. The Breck Forum, which is the place that I work at, but is also more importantly, um, the anchor of the New York City radical left community, is going to be spending a whole entire month doing black history programming starting tomorrow with Langston Hughes. Right, and continuing on throughout the month doing these kind of programs because we see it as important in terms of the intellectual life of the city. The fact of the matter is, is that what's happening to black and brown people is a genocide of crime, you know what I'm saying, in terms of stop and frisk and the destruction of a culture within our communities. You know what I'm saying? So when we talk about black history, well, not only talking about what happened in the past, but what, is, what, are, what are we uplifting and what are we holding up? You know what I'm saying? In terms of the vision of the city we looked at. So I just want to plug it out. Um, Breckform.org. I have flyers. I'll hand out later. But I, it's like, I just really appreciate it. All right? Thank you. Any closing comments? Any closing comments? No, sure. I got something to say. I ain't want to shy away from my mic. Uh, no, I think that... Uh, I, I want to. I, I just want to thank uh, everybody for 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 their comments, um, and and I want to leave us with, with with oh you know, I'll take this opportunity to pose one more question, and I want us to think about the difference or the relationship between the right to the city, and the responsibility to and for the city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, rights are something that you demand, and when we have to ask ourselves, because I done demanded a whole lot of shit, and ain't nobody ever cared. I done organized thousands of people to demand a lot of stuff, and ain't nobody ever cared. And I want us to ask ourselves that in the midst of that, whose responsibility is it to take right to the city, to take right for the city? What do we owe the city? What do we owe our communities and our neighborhoods Right. My man, Yusef Shakur in Detroit says this all the time, and I always make fun of him for saying it because he says it every time he speaks publicly. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and quote it because it, it makes sense. Um, <laughs> that you can't have a healthy city without healthy neighborhoods. And you can't have healthy neighborhoods without healthy communities. And I want us to think about what community building means for the right to the city and what is our responsibility to our communities and, 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 and the relationship of that to our responsibility to and for this city that we live in. Um, thank you. I just want to acknowledge that um, what happened today for me, it's again, I sense an assemblage of some sorts. And I not only want to encourage us to continue, you know, pursuing sort of that imagination and working together, but um, I'm also sad to not have heard a lot of the people that are in the audience because they're even more amazing than us. Uh, no, I mean, if we want to call ourselves here in front. I mean, they're absolutely, they're, they're really coming with, with uh, distinct agendas that surprise us all the time. Actually, the, the new generations that are constructing this, the ones that are asking the questions that uh, perhaps we were too old at the time that we asked them. You know? And it's, uh, it's happening here. So I want to invite the audience um, to follow uh, on these topics, uh, to construct your own organizations and teach us uh, by um, acknowledging the failures that all these organizations, our organizations, have had and building upon them. Uh, uh, learning from the 
from the non-success from the yeah that, that that I would say is very important. Again, I mentioned that this class um, is a public class. Uh, I, I find amazing that Bill is is is, is doing this. It's uh, is really. Uh, Perfect. Uh, you're all invited here on Thursday um, uh, at this time at seven. And uh, Bill, I guess you want to say something else. I will tell you that you're all invited. Um, the students haven't read the end of their uh, syllabus yet, but on May 16th, from about this time seven to about nine, these students are going to report back to you how they've taken these ideas and report back saying this is what we've thought about. And I think moving from the right to the city to the responsibility, because we do talk about it all, I demand this, I need this, but we really say, well, what are you gonna be responsible for? And how hard are you gonna to work to keep that chair at that table? Because the city is like, you know, a dog, you gotta walk it every day. <laughs> so we'll see you next Thursday, bye.